Today, I want to talk to you a bit about, um, I guess, some of the fundamentals of, of a lot of what we do in our lab and just being able to understand how to properly analyze um, basic NMR line shapes and, and the role that uh, tensors and um, all these interactions have on the, the line shapes. And I'll try and move my slide forward. There we go. So uh, it's quite a basic outline. Um, it was kind of difficult to decide at what level to present this tutorial. So we'll see how it goes and I'll stop after about 15 minutes for questions and then have a second section. So very briefly mention the, the NMR interactions that we're dealing with. I'm going to be talking about um, diamagnetic molecules and um, focusing on crystalline materials as well. Uh, so the two things I want to talk about, very simple isolated spins and of course we have spins one half and quadrupolar spins and then isolated spin pairs where obviously we can have then two spins half, two quadrupoles or one of each and we'll see what affects the line shapes and what you need to consider if you're acquiring spectra of these systems and, and how to properly simulate them. Okay, so as mentioned, we're looking at diamagnetic uh, molecules. I'm not going to be focusing on glassy materials either, um, where we have disorder, so very well-defined line shapes. Um, many of you probably know that then the, the core interactions that we're going to be considering, the chemical shift, which arises from magnetic shielding, direct dipolar coupling, the J coupling, and in case of quadrupolar nuclei, obviously the nuclear electric quadrupole interaction. And I'm not going to spend time getting into what these are. That's not the focus of this talk. I assume everyone has some uh, basis for knowing what those are already. So let's start with isolated spins. Um, very simple. Start with spin one half. Um, what do I mean by an isolated spin? So obviously we're, we have no um, coupled neighbors, J coupled or dipolar coupled uh, neighbors, or at least not to a good approximation. Uh, this is obviously why we do uh, proton decoupling all the time so that we have essentially isolated spin. And this will be a quite a simple case where we look at the chemical shift tensor and how we extract the, the principal components of the, the chemical shift tensor using the static or magic angle spinning experiments. And then how, um, how, these, how the elements of this tensor relate to crystallographic symmetry. Okay, so some basics here. We're looking at chemical shift tensor magnitudes for an isolated spin one half system and the various conventions in use in the literature. And I wanted to get into some of this because um, I made the mistake of uh, looking on Twitter, which is always a mistake. And I, I saw there was some interest in, in learning a bit about uh, Euler angles and tensor orientations, which is obviously an important topic. And um, before we get into that, we need to understand some of the conventions, even just for looking at the magnitudes of the tensors. So in principle, the chemical shift tensor will have up to nine independent elements. If we focus on only the symmetric part of the tensor, we get down to six independent elements. And then we can get down to three principal components if we diagonalize the tensor. So uh, typically when we analyze these spectra, uh, simple spectra powder patterns, there's three elements that define them. So you can see at the top there, we can just use a delta one, one, two, two, three, three convention where we pick off the singularities in the powder pattern. Uh, it's very intuitive and straightforward. There's also what's known as the Hertzfeld-Berger convention, um, which translates into using the span and skew, which as you can see is defined on this slide. And this was um, further emphasized in this 1993 paper by Joan Mason. And then there's the Haberlin convention, which is in common use. Um, one of the reasons for this, I believe, is because the, the, these forms of the, the tensor actually, or the representations of the tensor, show up um, kind of by default in a lot of the, the Hamiltonians that people use to analyze experiments. However, in my opinion, they're a little less intuitive for um, understanding directly what they mean when you're, you're looking at a spectrum. Uh, so I'll point you to some lively discussions of these conventions in the literature from uh, 20 years ago or so. Um, we'll come back to these a little bit as needed, um, but it's important obviously to know what these parameters mean. Um, you can see at the bottom, for example, there's a lot of different uses of the symbol delta, delta, delta. Um, it's important to know what you're talking about, or that you're talking about anisotropy, reduced anisotropy. There's a factor of three halves that creeps in there that uh, you really need to pay attention to. Now, why do we want to measure these chemical shift tensors uh, for spin half nuclei? Well, uh, obviously these provide information on the site symmetry at the nucleus. 
and this has important applications in NMR crystallography. So you can see in this table here, for example, that the number of independent components in the chemical shift or shielding tensor um, depends directly on the, the site symmetry at the nucleus in the crystal you're looking at. Um, so this can obviously be valuable if you have a crystal structure, then um, that crystal structure can limit the number of adjustable parameters that you're, you're trying to fit. Or conversely, if you don't have a diffraction-based structure, um, then you get some information on the allowed uh, point groups at the nucleus by the number of independent components that you measure from the chemical shift tensor. Okay, so how do we measure these? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because this is one of the most basic cases, isolated spin half nucleus. Uh, typically we get um, the principal components from the static powder pattern or with magic angle spinning. And as I showed two slides ago, you can see these are simulated patterns, but uh, you get the idea we can acquire a spectrum and, and pull out the principal components. We can do magic angle spinning. And in this 1997 paper, uh, Hodgkinson and Emsley uh, did a systematic analysis of kind of what are the optimal conditions, uh, particularly under magic angle spinning conditions for getting out the anisotropy and the asymmetry of these tensors. And um, they found that um, for the anisotropy, uh, actually an optimum number of spinning sidebands was five. Uh, whereas for the asymmetry parameter, very slow spinning or simply using the, the static spectrum provides reliable measurements. So I guess the point that uh, you should take away from this is uh, in all cases, if you want to get accurate and precise data, you want to be um, acquiring multiple data sets. So ideally you want to get this with uh, under static conditions, but then also with a few spinning rates and ideally a couple of field strengths to really minimize the uncertainty in what you're measuring. Okay, uh, let's move to isolated quadrupolar spins. So the first half of this talk is looking at isolated spins. I'll then take a break and we'll talk about spin pairs. So as many of you know, about 75% of the spin active nuclei in the periodic table are quadrupolar, so spin greater than one half. So in the next few minutes, I'll briefly touch on what uh, the static and magic angle spinning spectra look like, how you analyze them, um, second order effects, satellite transitions, and of course the Euler angles that um, that we need to simulate the spectra when we have both quadrupolar and chemical shift effects. So there's a few definitions on the left. I, I'm not gonna walk through every definition. We need to worry about the quadrupolar coupling constant, the asymmetry parameter. Uh, the quadrupolar coupling constant CQ can be re-expressed as a quadrupolar frequency, which uh, is often useful. And I guess a couple of points I wanted to make here is that for an isolated quadrupolar spin, you can see at the top right there, the total breadth of the central transition is given by a simple formula, which relates um, to the, this parameter A, which is shown at the bottom left. So it scales with the square of the quadrupolar frequency divided by the Larmor frequency. And if you do magic angle spinning, you can see in equation five there that we get a narrowing of, by a factor of about three to four, depending on uh, the asymmetry parameter. In the table I'm showing you here uh, for the various uh, different spins, three halves, five halves, seven halves, nine halves, you can see how the, the breadth of this central transition actually compares for the different uh, spins. And I guess uh, one of the important points here is that for the higher spin quantum numbers, you can measure actually much larger quadrupolar coupling constants because of the, the line narrowing effect. Um, so you can see, for example, uh, for spin nine halves, uh, the center column here, we have a, a line width of 0 0.00723 relative to 0.13 for a spin three halves. So this is the reason why you can measure very large quadrupolar coupling constants for things like cobalt 59, whereas for things like sodium 23 and chlorine 35, beyond a few megahertz, uh, you can no longer do magic angle spinning. This is an inherent property of the, uh, the way the, the Hamiltonian determines the spectrum. So for those of you who don't, who don't know, here's what we're talking about in terms of an isolated quadrupolar nucleus. At the top left, you have the central transition and both satellite transitions for a spin three halves nucleus. So it extends uh, quite a ways from minus the quadrupolar frequency to plus the quadrupolar frequency. If we zoom in on that central transition, that's what we uh, often is the only thing we look at, uh, except for things like deuterium, obviously. Um, then you get this line shape, which arises from a second order treatment, and you have these interesting discontinuities, which arise from the, the quadrupolar coupling, um, 
which uh, you can fit to get out quadrupolar parameters. And on the right are simulated spectra of an isolated quadrupolar nucleus with various asymmetry parameters. So the shaded spectra under stationary conditions and under magic angle spinning, you get the, um, the hollowed out um, uh, powder patterns, again, a narrowing by a factor of about three to four. <clears throat> now it's important to realize that um, in addition to that second order line shape that I just showed you, we have other second order quadrupolar effects. Uh, one of the most important ones is the second order quadrupolar shift, which um, was described well in this paper by Samuelson in 1985. And um, you can see in the equation three at the top left there that this second order quadrupolar shift depends on the square of the quadrupolar coupling constant, as well as the Larmor frequency, the spin quantum number, et cetera. Um, and so these shifts are tabulated here. So you can see, for example, quadrupole shifts, first line we have a shift of minus two in these frequency units, minus 0 0.12, 0 0.4, et cetera. These are all shifts that affect uh, the spectrum beyond the isotropic chemical shift. The top right, I've expanded this equation in particular for a spin three halves nucleus for the central transition. So it's very easy to see what we're talking about. So you have a shift of minus 140 in these units away from the true chemical shift. Um, this is always, for the central transition, it's always negative, so it's always the lower frequency. You can see in the bottom right here, a simulated spectra for a spin seven halves nucleus. This assumes infinite spinning speed just to see what happens to the, the center band or the central transition and the, the three satellites here. And it becomes very apparent here. So zero would be the true isotropic chemical shift. And you can see we have these second order shifts for the central transition. The one half to three halves, they're both negative shifts. And for the three halves to five halves, five half to seven halves, we actually have positive shifts. And these are second order effects that we cannot uh, get rid of by magic angle spinning or by going to, to higher field. Uh, we can reduce those effects as shown here. So um, let's look on the right first. We have a static, some static NMR spectra of lanthanum 139 at various fields, uh, experimental and simulated spectrum. And you can see this, both the second order broadening of this peak, this powder pattern gets narrower as we go to higher fields from bottom to top. And the pattern shifts closer to the true isotropic chemical shift, so always to higher frequency. On the left, we have magic angle spinning uh, spectra. See, these are boron 11 spectra of hexamethyl borazine, again at three fields. And you see the same type of thing. So the second order broadening reduces with the magnetic field and we get closer and closer to the true, true isotropic chemical shift. And again, this can be eliminated, but not, or sorry, reduced, but not eliminated by going to higher and higher field or by doing faster and faster the mag uh, magic angle spinning. Now, uh, one further note on quadrupolar nuclei before we uh, move on to adding in chemical shift effects is that uh, all of this is a second order treatment that I just showed you. Um, so treating uh, the quadrupolar interaction as a second order perturbation to the Zeeman interaction. But we know that there are many nuclei with very large quadrupolar couplings and uh, you get to a certain point where uh, the second order approximation no longer holds. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this today. We have a lot of papers related to this, um, but ideally what you want is a, uh, a Larmor frequency um, five or 10 times higher than your quadrupolar frequency to be able to treat and analyze the spectra using uh, second order perturbation theory. Uh, this is just an example here. I won't walk you through it, um, but in black, this is a, a rhenium 185, 187 spectrum. If you try to treat that with uh, second order perturbation theory, you get the red spectrum, which is clearly way off. And we showed in a few papers what you, what you have to do. And in cases like this, this is where you start to think about uh, going to nuclear quadrupole resonance uh, rather than NMR. So I'm not going to go further into that today, but it's certainly something to be aware of. Um, uh, you know, with higher and higher magnetic fields and bigger and bigger magnets coming online, more and more people are starting to, to push the boundaries of what they can do with quadrupolar nuclei. And it, it is something to keep in mind that um, you need this ratio of about five or 10. Okay, so let's come back to cases where we have a relatively small quadrupolar coupling. Um, so we're still talking about an isolated spin, a single spin. But obviously, if we have this spin in a um, 
asymmetric environment, that you're going to have a chemical shift anisotropy as well as a quadrupolar coupling. And there's some cases that left here just showing you that uh, putting together, adding on this chemical shift anisotropy does not always actually lead to a broader spectrum. This is highly orientation dependent. So you can see uh, on the right, for example, we have um, a simulated spectrum with um, only chemical shift anisotropy, only quadrupolar coupling. You put the two of them together and it's uh, not necessarily wider than what you began with. And again, this is highly orientation dependent. This would have up to eight adjustable parameters. You'd have three components of the chemical shift tensor, uh, the two magnitudes of the EFG tensor, and then three angles to relate these. And that's what I'll talk about next. Um, so when you're, if you want to fit these kind of line shapes, it's important to, uh, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, you really need to get a lot of data if you want to have uh, accurate and precise fits. So that means acquiring both magic angle spinning and stationary spectra, multiple fields, and making use of uh, crystallographic symmetry if available to limit the number of adjustable parameters. Okay, Euler angles. So I, as I say, I saw some people talking about this on Twitter, so I, I added a few more slides to, uh, to talk about this. Um, so I'll just go through it's on the slide and walk you through an example. So we, when we diagonalize the quadrupolar or EFG and chemical shift tensors, we get two sets of eigenvectors. One which relates the principal axis system of the EFG to a molecule fit axis system and one which relates the chemical shift principal axis system to the molecule fixed axis system. And typically what we want to do is know the relative orientations of the EFG and chemical shift tensors. When I say diagonalization, that means that we're taking the symmetric part of the tensor and express that in a particular axis system where the off diagonal elements are zero and have been in effect, in effect replaced by orientation information which we express as angles or, or eigenvectors. So we're left with principal components, magnitudes, three magnitudes. So here's an example of uh, the convention that, uh, that we use, and I'll talk a bit more about conventions. Um, so on the left, you can see we have a starting point where we have what we call coincident tensors. We have three components of the EFG tensor in blue, labeled B11, B22, B33. Three components of, in this case, it's a shielding tensor, but it, same thing for chemical shift, labeled 112233. Now, the first rotation about the angle alpha, we basically grab the red sigma 3, 3 uh, axis system and rotate it counterclockwise ar around sigma 3, 3. So you can see that brings sigma 2, 2 all the way around past V11, so past 270 degrees. In this example, we're rotating 287.5 degrees. The next step, you grab sigma 2, 2 and rotate that red axis system, again, counterclockwise, in this case, by 46.5 degrees. And then finally, around the angle gamma, you grab sigma 3, 3, again, the new sigma 3, 3, and rotate counterclockwise, in this case, 5.8 degrees. So what I'm showing you on the right there is a final set of relative orientations defined by those Euler angles. And we'll walk through a very simple example here. This is using what is known as the ZYZ convention. So you have two axis systems, one in black, one in red. You, you're, the black system will stay stationary. It's the reference system. The red system will move. So again, we rotate about alpha. So you rotate around Z1 counterclockwise. Next, you rotate about the Y axis of the red system by an angle beta counterclockwise. Now this gives us the angle beta between the black capital Z and the new red Z. And then finally, we uh, grab the new red Z3 axis and rotate again counterclockwise around gamma, and that gives us this final uh, orientation here. <clears throat> so this is another representation of what I just showed you. Um, the easiest angle to visualize is beta. It's always the angle between the two largest components. The others are, can be visualized like this but are a little less intuitive. This is the convention our program uses to talk about these angles. Now, there's another couple programs I'm mentioning here that, that you can have a look at, which do the same thing. This is for interpreting um, the results of quantum chemical calculations. Um, so why, do, why are these orientations important? Well, they're dictated by crystallographic symmetry and magnetic symmetry or lack thereof. So they, 
again, the, the crystallographic symmetry will tell you uh, if there's restrictions or conversely, if you don't know the crystal symmetry, then these angles can tell you something about the allowed symmetries. So there's just a range of simulated spectra here showing you the total, the range of line shapes you can get in this case for sodium 23 um, with a quadrupole interaction and a chemical shift anisotropy. You can see by changing the, the asymmetry of the tensor, the span of the tensor, the angles, obviously you get completely different spectra. Okay, I'm almost done part one. I'll, I think this is the last slide in part one. So why are these uh, tensor orientations sometimes confusing? Well, unsurprisingly, there are some different conventions in the literature. Uh, so the convention I just talked about, the ZYZ order, is used in several papers cited here. It's also used in the W Solid software, which, which I use from Klaus Eichele. It's also used in Simpson, but there is a caveat to that, which I'll talk about. But there are, there are other conventions in the literature. So for example, using ZXZ, um, it's an equally valid way to define the Euler angles. You just need to be sure you know what you're talking about when you look at these angles. So what is the pitfall? Um, one of the problems or one of the issues arises from the labeling of the principal components. Okay, so I, I talked about here taking the largest uh, component, which we're labeling Z. But one of the problems that arises, if I go back here, is um, in the Haberlin Convention, the component which is labeled Z is the one furthest from the isotropic chemical shift. And so the physical meaning of that component actually changes depending on the asymmetry of the tensor. And this is not the case if you use the other two labeling methods. Uh, so I believe this is what happens in Simpson. Um, so you just need to understand uh, what's happening with the labeling of the components. Uh, so to get around this ambiguity, uh, you know, using a, a matrix of direction, cosines, or list of eigenvectors makes things really clear, but obviously it's very helpful to have uh, angles. It's a concise way of expressing this sort of thing. Okay, there we go. Any questions? Okay, great. Thank you for a uh, clear definition of... Uh all of these different types of components. It's uh, definitely something that I've, I've struggled with in the past. Um, so I have a, a question from um, an anonymous attendee um, about the, uh, the different second order shifts for um, the central and satellite transition. So is there any uh, physical insight you can give for why uh, the central transition has a negative shift, whereas some of the satellite transitions have positive shifts? Uh, where does that arise from? Well, so we could see it all arises from this equation depending, so you can see that um, this shift depends on um, both the spin quantum number and the transition you're looking at. Um, and so you can see in this case for the spin seven half nucleus, we actually have two of them go positive, two of them go negative. Uh, as for physical uh, meaning, it, it's, it arises simply from working out um, the sign arising from this equation depending on the value of, of M for the, the transition you're looking at. And is this something you have to sort of take account of if you're trying to um, fit the spectra or would you not simultaneously try and fit the satellite transitions? Well, certain, certainly needs to be taken into account. Um, so again, this, this simulated spectrum showing here is in the uh, hypothetical limit of infinite MAS, so you have no sidebands just to see the effect. Now, obviously, norm, in normal cases, uh, the, the uh, central transition appears much more intense because uh, it's much narrower. Uh, but certainly, these shifts have to be taken into account if you want to simulate satellite transitions. Uh, I actually have another question on that. I will, I will get back to the Q&A. Does this mean that your, the, side, the manifold of sidebands arising from different central transitions will no longer be coincident? or? Is it just where the most intense will change? Is, could you end up with yeah non non coincident manifolds of spinning sidebands? Oh, certainly, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because you can see the position of the center band is not the same for each of them. Um, so certainly, and and that's one of the things um, um, that yeah, if you have a really good crystalline sample, it's a really good way to test that you have. Uh, a good quality spectrum and a good magic angle set because you should be able to pull out both the 
and favorable cases, both the center band and the, the different spinning side bands for, uh, for the various satellite transitions. Okay, thank you, so that's really interesting. Um, so we've got another a question from uh, Tanya Avila. Um, do you know what convention is used for DM fit? Which I know a lot of us have struggled with. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, I didn't want to make any. The software that I know well is is the ones that we've written in our lab, and also W Solids. Um, so I, I don't want to make any false claims. My my understanding is it. I believe it uses the ZYZ convention. It probably follows the same definition as Simpson. So again, you've got to be careful about the labeling of the principal components. Um, but I, you know, I didn't write DM fit, so I'm not 100 percent sure. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and another question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, are there any applications where certain conventions are more useful, um, or is it just simply a matter of preference? Well, as I said, I think one of the reasons the Haberlin Convention originated and, and stuck around is because this form of the, the um, Reduced anisotropy, anisotropy and symmetry, those, those expressions tend to show up in a lot of uh, equations for simulating the line shapes in the Hamiltonians. And so it's kind of natural that they, they fall out as parameters that we use to describe um, the line shapes. However, uh, personally, I find some of the other, the other two conventions a little bit more intuitive because, again, uh, with the Haberlin convention, the, the definition of what we call the ZZ component um, changes depending on the asymmetry of the pattern, um, but there may not be necessarily a large physical change associated with the molecules. So for example, the, the highest frequency component or the lowest frequency component can be called our ZZ component. Um, it's just a convention, it depends what you're familiar with. It all comes down to the fact we have three principal components, whether you call them one, one, two, two, three, three, or something else, that they contain all the information. Okay, thanks. I, yeah, I remember seeing a recent case where uh, um, trying to use machine learning to um, uh, look at tensor components was being thrown off by, uh, um, I think, the Haberlin Convention because if you uh, because you can get those shifts, um, it suddenly jumps to bring one to the other, to, right. even if there's only a small change. So I guess exactly. that would be one situation where you, you'd have to use a different value. Okay, uh, another question from um, Uli. So, uh, or perhaps a comment. So, is it the case that the total second order quadrupolar shift is zero? So, it, just sort of eyeballing it, it looked like those se uh, second order shifts for the different satellite transitions um, yeah, added to like zero. Is that the case or not? It looks like she's answering the previous question, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think she's answering the previous question. Okay. Uh, well, if you don't have it, uh, any more to add on that, perhaps we move on. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, in which case, uh, do continue asking questions during the, uh, the second half of the tutorial. Um, uh, and we'll we'll go through them at the end. No questions on Euler angles. I guess I was clear. <laughs> okay, isolated spin pairs. So obviously there's three possibilities here: two spins, one half, two quadrupoles, or one of each. So the important thing to consider here uh, is the issue of chemical and magnetic equivalence in solids. Um, again, most people in NMR would be familiar with these topics. They're very become very important when you're trying to analyze the line shapes of coupled nuclei. Um, so we can consider uh, things like A2, AX, AB, AA prime systems. So uh, AX is obviously two completely different spins that are not related by a symmetry element and they're usually different uh, isotopes. AA prime is what we refer to as chemically equivalent or in the solid state, we should probably say crystallographically equivalent. And so they can be related by a symmetry element, but they are not uh, magnetically equivalent because they do not have identical tensor magnitudes and orientations. More specifically, in this case, the orientations are typically what, what the issue is. Uh, 
So in order to have true magnetic equivalence, an A2 system, you need identical magnitudes and orientations, and that could be achieved by uh, being related by an inversion center is the easiest one to visualize. So at the bottom left here, we have spins, uh, the red spin and the blue spin related by an inversion center in orange. And this ensures that we have identical tensor magnitudes and orientations. The other uh, examples in these boxes show other combinations of symmetry elements, which can lead to uh, also lead to um, crystallographic or magnetic equivalents. Okay, and not surprisingly, these, these different uh, spin systems will require a different treatment and give rise to different spectra. So we, as you can see here, some stationary spectra of a pair of spin one half nuclei. So both AX systems and then magnetically equivalent A2 systems. So at the bottom, the bottom row, you have just a simulated powder patterns for an isolated spin, so just the chemical shift interaction. And the top four rows show um, the effect of adding in a direct dipolar coupling between these spins uh, with different tensor orientations. So either beta equals zero or beta equals 90. So that's the angle between the largest components of the two tensors. And um, you can see in the, the highlighted case here showing a, a splitting for AX and A2 systems that in a, in a situation like this, you can you know, directly pull out. This is the effective dipolar coupling are effective uh, between the two spins. Um, but it's obviously very important to note here that this splitting, again, this factor of three halves creeps in uh, depending on whether or not you have magnetic equivalence. And this will completely change your interpretation of the spectrum, depending on whether you have magnetic equivalence or not. So that's an important point that I wanted to highlight here. Uh, another important point is that uh, in conditions like this, um, you can actually pull out directly dipolar couplings between spins. This type of thing obviously has been done for a long time with um, uh, pairs of protons in the early days of NMR. So here's an example looking at a carbon-13 dipolar chemical shift spectrum of uh, silver cyanide, where the carbon-13 and N15 have been enriched. In the top trace here, this is a zoom in with N14. So with N15, you get a nice simple splitting here for this AX system, which gives you the effective dipolar coupling constant. And you can verify that by looking at the carbon-13 coupled to N14. Obviously, there's a different magnetogyric ratio there, so you get a different splitting that you've got to scale for that. Uh, so this type of analysis uh, gets, allows you to get out bond lengths. Um, and in this case, we always have to be careful about worrying about motional averaging, the effect on the dipolar coupling, and also the effect of anisotropic J coupling, uh, which I'll mention in a slide or two. So I guess that's one point I'll make here is that remember the dipolar couplings you measure are uh, always, always also contain a contribution from the anisotropic part of the J coupling. Now, in many cases, this is negligible, but in many cases, it's not. Um, and I guess I'll just mention here, if you were to do a magic angle spinning spectrum or something like this, you've got to remember that you cannot use a, a simple uh, analysis like I showed you for the spin, isolated spin one half nucleus. You have to be sure that the software you're using will properly treat the dipolar interaction as well. Now, in the case of a pair of uh, an AB spin system in the solid state, um, so again, it's, it's become slightly different. You've got to worry about four transitions here for a homonuclear AB spin pair. It's going to depend on obviously the chemical shift, anisotropy, the dipolar coupling, the J coupling, the effective dipolar coupling. And of course, this is all orientation dependent. Uh, so here's an example. This is for phen a labeled uh, phenylacetic acid where we have the carbonyl carbon and the methylene carbon enriched with carbon-13. And these are the kind of spectra you get, experimental and simulated spectra. Um, so you can see at low field here, this is a 100 megahertz system, 200 megahertz, 400 megahertz system. And um, you have to use this type of equation and powder averaging to properly treat this spectrum. You can see at the lower field, you have these seemingly or the more pronounced effects of the dipolar coupling. Whereas at the higher field, the dipolar coupling seems smaller because the chemical shift anisotropy is, has become larger in Hertz. Um, and of course, you get the tensor orientations out of this as well, the relative tensor orientations. <clears throat> now, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but you have to be aware that for pairs of spin one and a half nuclei, uh, 
unless you're dealing with an AX system, they can also be very tricky. So AB systems or AA prime systems. So you can see, for example, on the right here, this is uh, N15 labeled cis azo benzene with two slightly non-equivalent N15s. And this actually is spinning rate dependent. Okay, it's a very kind of messy spectrum. And this arises from the fact that the homonuclear dipolar interac interaction doesn't commute with, cell with itself at all times during the rotor cycle. So you need iterative numerical simulations to properly simulate these spectra. It's typically gonna depend on the di dipolar tensor, the J tensor, their relative magnitudes. And again, these effects can be reduced or eliminated by going to higher B naught, because again, you, can, you don't change the nature of the spin system by going to higher magnetic field. So there's a whole bunch of interesting examples in the literature looking at related systems. I didn't wanna dwell on this, but something to uh, beware of that um, there are effects in seemingly simple systems that are not necessarily uh, accounted for with, um, with standard software. Okay, so let's move on to a spin one half coupled to a quadrupole. So we're talking about in the pole, First, let's talk about indirect quadrupole effects on the spin one-half nucleus. So under magic angle spinning conditions, the dipolar coupling between a spin one-half nucleus, let's say carbon-13, and a quadrupolar nucleus like N14 does not average to zero because the eigenstates of the quadrupolar nucleus are not perfect Zeeman eigenstates. Okay, we saw before that there's a second order effect. So for the spin one-half nucleus, one of the most prominent effects is the second order frequency shift. That's what I've shown here. This frequency shift of the spin one half nucleus is going to depend on this effective dipolar coupling, which again that can also contains the anisotropy of the J coupling. It's going to depend on the quadrupolar interaction of the quadrupolar nucleus, the Larmor frequency of the quadrupolar nucleus, the spin quantum number and transition, and of course the relative orientations. And so this is another effect that's uh, reduced but not eliminated by going to higher magnetic field because you're always left with this, this term that doesn't disappear, it can only be minimized. So if we include J coupling between the two spins, here's the expression we get for the various uh, spin states. You're going to have these frequency shifts. I'll show you an example in the next slide. Uh, interestingly, if you look at the quadrupolar nucleus itself, it also is perturbed, in particular the satellite transitions. So here's an example in this case. So I mentioned the example of carbon 13 and 14. Uh, what I'm showing you here is an example of phosphorus 31 coupled to O17 in O17 labeled triphenylphosphine oxide. It's only 30% labeled, and so the big peak here is simply the, the uncoupled phosphorus. But for the phosphorus, which is coupled to the O17, we actually get six uh, peaks. We can see a few of them here buried in the baseline. And you can see that obviously they're not uh, symmetrically spaced. At one end, these are squeezed together. At the other end, they're stretched out. Okay, so this is uh, exactly, precisely due to what I showed you on the previous slide here. You have both the J coupling between the phosphorus and oxygen, which remains constant for the different transitions, but then this residual quadrupole effect, which is different for each of the transitions. And so you have to be careful when analyzing this kind of spectrum. Of course, it's going to get even more messy when you have a spin one half nucleus coupled to more than one quadrupolar nucleus. And there's, there's some nice examples here from this paper. Um, so this is a seemingly simple case where you have a spin one half cadmium 113 coupled to three nitrogen 14s. And at first glance, this doesn't look that messy, but if you look carefully, you can see Again, a squeezing, a compression of the splitting at this end, and a stretching at this end, which can only properly be accounted for by considering this residual dipolar coupling. So you can see here the first kind of um, level of, the, of a stick diagram um, for a system like this, you get already asymmetric spacing because of the, the residual dipolar coupling. You go to four nitrogen 14s coupled to a single spin um, one half nucleus, it gets even messier. And again, you have to really uh, properly analyze this, including the full uh, effect of the um, residual dipolar coupling from all four quadrupolar nuclei. Uh, 
Um, and this type of analysis assumes that there's no dipolar couplings between the nitrogen 14s, which seems to be valid in this case, but obviously if there's then dipolar couplings between these, which are substantial, then things even get, get messier. <clears throat> now, um, we can have a case where uh, you have all four interactions contributing now. Um, so this, these are experimental and simulated spectra, again, for this triphenylphosphine oxide, looking at the O17. And in order to construct the correct complete line shape um, for oxygen, you obviously need to consider both the quadrupolar coupling, the chemical shift anisotropy of the oxygen, the J coupling to the phosphorus, the dipolar, sorry, the J, yeah, J coupling to the phosphorus, and the dipolar coupling to the phosphorus. And you can simulate each of these effects individually. Um, obviously, the line shapes don't, uh, they don't add up directly to give the final line shape because everything is orientation dependent. So you can imagine in principle, there's a huge number of adjustable parameters here. In principle, you have um, ignoring anti-symmetric anti elements, you'd have six for the J tensor, six for the chemical shift tensor. You have the dipolar coupling and its orientation. You have the EFG tensor and its orientation. So to be able to fit this kind of data, again, as I've mentioned a couple of times, you need to uh, acquire many data sets. So um, under magic angle spinning, to remove the effects of uh, chemical shift anisotropy and limit the number of adjustable parameters. And then you want to uh, also try to acquire data in many fields to reduce the number of unknowns. And of course, if you have a, a diffraction-based structure, you can use crystallographic symmetry to limit the number of adjustable parameters to the angles and that sort of thing. And again, conversely, if you don't have a diffraction-based structure, you can use some of the information you get out of this to, to tell you something about the crystallographic symmetry. And again, this is a case where the effect of dipolar coupling D prime uh, is really mod is modified from the true dipolar coupling by the anisotropy in J. So once you get beyond certainly hydrogen and some of the first row elements, this delta J can start to become uh, comparable to the dipolar coupling and and as you get further down the periodic table, it actually can become larger. So that's another thing to be aware of when you're analyzing these types of spectra. I have just a couple last slides on two quadrupoles coupled together because this is kind of a unique uh, case which can get complicated. Um, so I just wanted to mention some of our recent work uh, that uh, well, Fred Perraud did this in our group several years ago now. And if you use high resolution techniques like MQMAS or single crystal NMR, you can start to get sufficient resolution to interpret the spectra of two coupled quadrupoles. Uh, you can imagine there's a lot of adjustable parameters. Um, in this case shown here, uh, Fred showed that when we have magnetically equivalent quadrupoles, in this case two boron atoms, we can actually use a a spin echo experiment to pull out the J coupling and he found that these are actually directly dependent on whether or not you have magnetically equivalent uh, quadrupolar spins or not. And there's a few examples here where we know from diffraction that we have only crystallographic symmetry versus magnetic symmetry and you get this interesting amplification effect. And we can do the same thing with um, static samples. So looking at two coupled gallium atoms, actually you, you can pull out these satellites. And again, you have a really interesting dependence of these little powder patterns on whether or not you have an A2 system or an AX spin system. And uh, these factors of three halves, three or three halves uh, creep in again. <clears throat> so some useful software, the uh, most important thing to say is to test it for yourself on a, an example from the literature or against software that you know that works. I'm sorry if I left out someone's favorite software here. Obviously there's a lot of uh, other software which does um, is more focused on analysis of multi-dimensional spectra and that sort of thing. It's not always obvious from the documentation of the software whether how it treats a particular problem, what is in the code. Um, so it's best to test this on a known literature problem to see if you get the result you expect. I think I'll leave it at that and uh, see what questions there are on this half of the talk. Okay, great. Uh, thanks again. That was uh, that was really interesting. Some I, a lot of situations I didn't know could could really arise in practice. Um, so uh, just going over to the Q&A, the first question is, uh, 
how, how sort of messy and difficult do these, these spectra get um, when you have a spin half and quadrupolar nuclei and what's a sort of a recipe of how, how you uh, go about trying to solve these problems and, and deconvolute all the contributions? Okay, so yeah, it says, how do the J DNA symmetry parameters used? Um, so let's go back maybe to look at uh, expression here. Okay, so, um, well, one thing that you can remember actually is that although you have these stretching and squeezing here, you can actually, the, uh, the distance or the, the frequency from one edge to the other is just a simple multiple of the J coupling. So you can always pull out that directly. Um, I suppose it's a question of how much you know about your system already, whether you know the structure, whether you have a crystal structure, whether you're trying to back that out. Um, when it comes down to it though, you, you know, the <clears throat> you've got a dipolar coupling, and a quadrupolar coupling and a J coupling. So if you can get this data to a couple different fields, it's actually not too hard to fit. Um, so it's not too messy, I would say. It's a matter of um, getting good quality spectra and being able to, to fit all the, the lines. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the next question is uh, from Nana's attendee. How is it possible to get bond parameters um, by analyzing these tensors or line shapes. I'm not sure what they mean by bond parameters. Um, I guess bond lengths, bond orders. Uh, well, sure. Uh, so bond lengths come uh, from the dipolar coupling. Uh, but again, you need to be aware that there's motional averaging that could affect that relationship. So the, the uh, dipolar coupling that you measure with NMR will be a vibrationally average dipolar coupling and could also be influenced by the, the delta J value. Um, in terms of things like um, the order of the bond, uh, that's best done probably in concert with quantum chemistry where you can establish some correlations between, for example, the J coupling and, and um, whether you've got a single, double or triple bond. So we've done some of that with boron and gallium. And these are well established for things like uh, alkanes, alkenes, alkynes. Um, so yes, that's the answer. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and this is good. I, I, I managed to correctly guess the, the question there. Um, so uh, next question from Ernest Prack. Um, the software you mentioned are only for static simulations or are they valid in the fast motion limit? Uh, it depends on the software. Most of them, most of them do both. Um, the Quest software that we've developed in our group is more specifically targeted for the breakdown of the, the high field approximation for quadrupolar nuclei. So in that situation, it's not practical to do magic angle spinning. Um, so there, and then, then so static fast, fast limit. And then um, there are some obviously that can do magic angle spinning at any rate as well, like Simpson. Okay, thank you. Uh, so a question from uh, Tahunia. Um, does the J coupling get important for highly symmetric crystals, octahedral or tetrahedral? Well, um, get important. I, I, uh, I suppose she means in terms of the effect on the line shape and the answer. I guess it's in situations where uh, the, your other interactions are isotropic due to the symmetry. Well, yeah, certainly. Certainly if, if um, your chemical shift on isotropy and your quadrupolar coupling uh, are vanishing, and then you have uh, your, your nucleus bonded to four or six equivalent atoms, sure, you should expect to see that J coupling. Yeah. Great. Uh, maybe a, a practical question from my, um, what, what are your favorite educational resources on quadrupolar NMR for beginners? Um, good question. Self-promotion uh, definitely allowed. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess Mark Smith's book is more about um, looking at data for quadrupolar nuclei and inorganic materials, but it's got a relatively good introduction to quadrupolar nuclei. Um, Phil Grandinetti has a series of slides that actually get pretty complex, but it's got a good uh, introduction as well. You can probably find online. I think Rob Shurko has some slides available online as well. Um, 
I'm probably missing some, but uh, <laughs> it's best to look in many places. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so a question from Stuart Elliott. Um, in solution NMR, the relaxation of quadrupolar nuclei, um, scalar couple to spin half nuclei, um, can have a remarkable influence on the spectrum of the spin half nucleus. Uh, do you get similar relax relaxation driven effects in solid state? Sure, exactly. So in, in the spectrum I'm showing you here, um, you know, you're only going to get these line shapes, or if I go to the next slide, you're only going to get these if the quadrupolar nucleus is relaxing slow enough to actually uh, generate these effects. But you can find counterexamples where the, the quadrupolar nucleus is relaxing too fast. And then you would get some even messier line shape, which depends on the relaxation rate of the quadrupolar nucleus, or you might the coupling might vanish if you have uh, something with a very uh, fast quadrupolar relaxation rate, so yes. Okay, great. Uh, question from um, Nathan Barrow. Uh, so you talked about anisotropic J-coupling appearing as a, uh, a, an apparent dipole contribution. Is there any sort of rule of thumb or suggestion on what to look for in a spectrum in order to spot anisotropic J-coupling? Uh, not really, because they, they show up in exactly the same form in the Hamiltonian. You can't separate them by any NMR method. They are the same. Um, so the, if you really want to look at that, you have to have an independent measure of the dipolar coupling, which typically comes from crystallography. And or you need a quantum chemical calculation of the anisotropic J coupling to have a, a handle on how big you might expect that to be. But in terms of looking at a spectrum, they you cannot separate those two with NMR. Okay, perhaps a, a related question from an anonymous attendee. Is it possible to use a uh, heteronuclear decoupling to deconvolute the different contributions to these sort of spectra? Sure, yeah, if you've got uh, the right kind of probe and the power set up, you should be able to decouple these. Yeah. Okay. Um, See also Joe Zwanziger has made a, a very good comment about um, being able to read the source code for these spectra uh, simulation packages. Obviously that's very important. And I forgot to mention the code that Joe's involved with, which is Abinit. <laughs> Um, I, I guess the, the obvious question then is, uh, is the source available for some of the, the software you mentioned? Right, so uh, the w solid, w solid software that I tend to use is, um, it's documented with the, the uh, original literature, but I don't think you can look at the actual code. Uh, Quest, uh, if it's not on our website, we can make it available, uh, but again, it's well documented. Um, the others, again, it, it, you'd have to go to their website to be 100% sure. Okay. Uh, perhaps a, a final question that's just appeared. Um, could you uh, give a, the physical um, origin of quadrupolar coupling? So uh, just, to, just to finish it right at the end, but what, what actually uh, quadrupolar coupling is and where that comes from. And why it, is, it, so it arises from a non-spherical distribution of the protons and neutrons in the nucleus itself. So in a spin one half nucleus, you'd have a spherical electric charge distribution in the nucleus. And therefore, there's no preferred electric orientation in the, in the crystal. With a quadrupolar nucleus, you have a football shape, prolate or oblate um, distribution of electric charge in the nucleus itself. And so uh, the electric field gradient then kind of competes to align the angular momentum of that nucleus and this competes with the, the Zeeman effect. And so in pure nuclear quadrupole resonance, you just, you don't have the Zeeman effect, you just, you have the quadrupolar coupling. For spin one half nuclei in NMR, you have just the Zeeman effect. And then when you have somewhere in between, you have this competition between the, the Zeeman and quadrupole effects that um, comes from the asymmetric or anisotropic distribution of charge within the nucleus. Yeah, so uh, follow up question, so I imagine the same person. Um, and so to, to, to reiterate, it's an electric field of your nucleus which couples to the electric field, sorry, an electric field gradient of your nucleus which couples to the electric field gradient of your crystal. Um, okay, sorry, I've just seen multiple questions have popped up. Um, 
So is a uh, quadrupolar coupling um, in NMR related to zero field splitting in EPR? Can you comment on that, maybe? Zero field splitting. Well, uh, I'm not super familiar with that. My instinct would be, um, I mean, EPR, is, we're looking at the electron, and EP, we can have EPR. It doesn't have to necessarily be a quadrupolar nucleus. I don't think there's a... I'm not sure. I mean, it's, it's similar in that there's a splitting that arises, but... Uh, I, think, I think it is related to uh, electron spins greater than half. Uh, I think that might be the, the analogy there. Okay. Um, okay, uh, another question from Ernest Prack. Is there simulation software um, for emotionally average uh, spin one UPI that you could recommend? Yeah, we've used, um, there's a web tool online from Species Group. Uh, there's also the Express software from Bob Volt's group. Those are two that we've used for looking at motion of deuterium. I'm sure there are others. Um, okay. Uh, I missed any. Okay, so uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. So uh, earlier we were talking about uh, the case where the relaxation rate for quadrupolar nucleus is um, is fast and you don't get clear line shapes. Um, is there a, any particular experimental technique you can apply in this case? I'm not sure if we're talking about um, coupled to a spin one half or just looking at the quadrupole itself. Well, in either case, I guess, they're both useful. Well, I mean, if the relaxation rate is fast, you can always do things like uh, lower the temperature, I suppose, to try to slow down the relaxation. Um, that's what I would suggest. Okay. Uh, I think we've addressed all of the questions. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Professor Price again very much for the um, incredibly helpful uh, uh, rundown of different uh, tensors in play and also incredibly well documented so we can all go back through the video and uh, pick out the sources uh, as we require. And yes, Ilya, I didn't mention spinach. He's put up spinach. It's another great uh, software package that does a lot of things.